The French reorganized the Ohio River as a gateway to the Mississippi, providing a link between their extensive colonies in Canada and Louisiana. In 1749, Montreal Captain Pierre-Joseph Celeron de Blainville led an expedition down the Ohio claiming the surrounding territory for France. The early settlers chose to build an outpost around the fertile banks of Wheeling Creek and planted cornfields, which extended north to Fort Henry. The department commanders at Fort Pitt during 1778 and 1779 had undertaken some campaigns into the Indian country in the present state of Ohio, but without important success. With the abandonment of Fort Randolph at the mouth of the Kanawha River in June 1779, Fort Henry remained the most advanced outpost of the Upper Ohio. Late in the summer of 1779, General Broadhead made a vigorous campaign against the Indians of the Upper Allegheny, and the punishment he inflicted on the tribes in that vicinity was another factor in taming the savage spirit in the western wilds. Some residents about Wheeling were participants in this Broadhead campaign. During 1780, the struggle in the West went on with varying fortunes. While Clark was strengthening the American foothold in the lower Ohio Valley, his cherished project of capturing Detroit failed for lack of men. General Broadhead at Fort Pitt was also planning a campaign against Detroit, his enterprise being the auspices of the regular Continental Army while Clark was representing the colony of Virginia. A counter-movement was undertaken by the British from Detroit, one division being directed against Kentucky and the other towards northwestern Virginia. The purpose of the latter was to divert attention, and it became, in fact, a plundering party, avoiding in its raids such large posts as Fort Henry. The enemy crossed the river near Wheeling, but the inhabitants had been warned by scouts and were nearly all safe at Wheeling. In the settlements between the river at Catfish Camp, Washington, Pennsylvania, a number of prisoners were taken. The Indians then became alarmed at the rapid concentration of militia at Wheeling. Hurriedly, they withdrew across the Ohio, but not until they had ruthlessly butchered all the male captives. Throughout the seasonable months of 1780, General Broadhead was endeavoring to get forces assembled and supplies for the projected campaign against the Indians in Ohio, but late in the fall had to abandon the enterprise. A lively correspondence was carried on between the department commander and the captains of the garrisons at Wheeling and vicinity. Interest as showing the difficulties in getting a properly equipped army ready for an aggressive movement. Fort Henry and Holliday's Cove both had garrisons of regular enlisted men at this time, and when in October, these garrisons were ordered to leave their posts. Colonel Shepard, as county lieutenant, was directed to supply their places with members of the militia. During the previous spring, when the first orders were sent out for this expedition, the local officers were advised to urge upon the settlers haste in planting and sowing the summer crops before the muster was made. Nothing illustrated better advantage the poverty of this frontier country. But in 1780, the citizens of Ohio County went out to war. They must first make provision against famine and want in their homes. This primary necessity provided for, there might then remain a few weeks for active campaigning in a distant country. Somewhere amongst this time, there was another campaign underway amidst the lively chatter of the forest. A man went underway into the unknown territory on what would be a terrific hunt for the most terrifying beast in the timber. The Savage Beast of Two Legs. Wyandotte Indians were rampant that year in their raids against the villagers. It was up to one man to protect the village and get retribution for his father's tragic death. Lewis Wetzel often went into the wilderness for long solo hunting excursions, 
For days he continued on this way, but not an Indian was discovered. At last, the greenish gloom of the forest began to change to a somber yellow. The air became damp and chilly. It was the approach of night. In a sheltered ravine, Wetzel selected a spot behind some fallen trees and dug a small hole. In the bottom of this, he built a little campfire, covering it loosely with leaves and earth. He was cold. Seating himself on the ground and encircling the hole with his legs, he covered himself with his blanket. This arrangement would not discover him to any wandering savages, and yet was, said he, as warm as the storeroom. When he thoroughly warmed, he took out some dried venison and parched corn, and he ate his supper. A drink from a neighboring spring quenched his thirst. Spreading some branches on the ground, he lay down close behind the sheltered log, and amid the twitter and bickering of the innumerable birds, the hum of the insects, and howls of the invisible animals, he quickly fell asleep. Continuing on the unbeaten trail, on the afternoon of the next day, Wetzel suddenly came across an empty camp. Two blankets and a kettle taught him that its occupants were two Indians who would return from their hunt at night. He was patient. He concealed himself nearby. At nightfall, the two redskins came in. They cooked a savory supper. The odor from the roasting venison was wafting to the hungry Wetzel. He intended to wait till they slept, but these two citizens of the forest were high in humor. Hour after hour, they laughed and joked in their unintelligible jargon and making the forest ring with their merriment. At last, one seized a flaming brand and started into the forest. Through the black darkness, moved with silent tread this strange figure on which fell the ruddy light from the glowing ember. Was it some deed of vengeance or some act of worship which impelled the torchbearer on into the night? The red coal danced in and out amongst the trees, growing fainter and fainter. At last, it disappeared from view altogether. Wetzel turned. The calm, regular snore of the remaining savage told plainly of his slumber. It was but a moment's work for the wokeful fool to steal forward. With one knife stroke, plunge the Indian into a sleep which knew no waking, seize the scalps, and quickly commence the homeward trip. In two days, Wetzel delivered his trophy at Wheeling, and with troubled conscience, received the blood money. Well, hey guys, thanks for checking out the video. And if you like videos like this, please be sure to subscribe to the channel, smash that like button and share this with your friends and family. And as always, remember to get out there and explore. Thanks guys.